Hi, welcome to Mindful Conversations. I am Greg DeWire. I have a question for you tonight. Do you believe in evil? Do you believe in superstition? Do you believe in demons? My guest today is Father Larry Elward and also his wife, Debbie. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank, Thank you for, for having us. us. That was perfect. You guys said that at exactly the same time. <laughs> We've how been long practicing all week. How, <laughs> how long have you guys been married? 19 years. And you're a Catholic priest, so explain I, yourself. I am an independent Catholic priest. Okay, so what, what exactly is an independent Catholic priest? An independent Catholic priest is a priest that um, is involved with something called the sacramental movement or things like that, independent movement. Okay. And, and what we do is um, we just don't get along with anybody. Right, so you basically awesome. are independent. We, 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 like want, we want to do our own thing, okay. but we, do, we don't want to do it within the strictures of a... Uh, so-called um, fundamental church. Okay, and, so, and your title would be what, exorcist? I'm a priest and an exorcist. A priest and an exorcist. So this is a serious, serious topic. I know in the Catholic Church that not every priest has the ability to do an exorcism, and I also know that if there's a case on hand, it could last years, right? It's not like somebody comes in and just does something, right? It's a long process. Actually, every priest has the ability to do an exorcism. They do. Oh, I they, didn't know that. They okay. just don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. So why don't they want to do it? Well, there's, um, being an independent priest, I can cut through all the red tape oh, yeah. that um, okay. most priests have to go through. Okay, so what's the red tape? If I was a priest of the Catholic order, uh, I had a bishop ordain me, and I was in line with uh, the Pope, what would be the red tape? How long would it take? What's the process? All right, you have to be with a monsignor or a priest or something from the parish. Okay. Then you have to go through a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Right. And then a group of other priests would have to discuss the whole situation. Wow. Whether you were um, a candidate for an exorcism or if, we, if you actually had um, a demon possession or an attachment or okay. an oppression or something like that. Gotcha. The trouble is, what if you're not a Catholic? Oh, I see. A lot of people... Um, <laughs> A lot of people aren't Catholics. And they okay. have the problem. So what would happen if you would go to a Catholic uh, church to ask for an exorcism and you were Protestant? Right. Or, um, or a Muslim or a Jew or right. something like that. Sure. You know? Right. Or, or an atheist. Yeah, right. Whatever. Whatever. We've done, we've done all of them. Okay. Uh, they would get the short shrift of uh, all this other stuff. So uh, Debbie being a clairvoyant and we work with a bunch of uh, very, very qualified people, we could uh, pretty much cut through the red tape and discern whether or not the person is actually possessed. How do you do that? Is it just experience? You just know it's a sixth sense, no pun intended? Well, I mean, how do you know that? Well, I don't have the sixth sense, but okay. I've, I've been doing this for about 35 years. Wow. And I've started with Ed Lorraine Warren back in the 80s. Yes, I know them. Probably heard Knew of them. Knew of them. Yeah, 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 saw them in Newtown years yeah. and years yeah, ago. Yeah, me too, me yeah. too. And uh, Debbie worked with them also. She's... Yeah, Debbie, how did you get involved with this? Um, well, I always could see things as a child. Like and what? Like ghosts, spirits? Well, what? my like ancestors, what? my relatives okay. that had passed on. All right. And um, I would always have imaginary friends. And um, I just thought it was part of growing up. And I remember telling my mother and father some incident I had seen my great grandmother. And they said, that's not possible. You're, this is 1957. She died in 1953. You didn't see her. Right. And I said, but she talked to me. She had. A Scottish brogue and she, now now and my mother I said but I talked to her and I taught I described her and my mother said I don't ever want you to do this again she said because you're either gonna people are gonna talk and they're gonna right. have you put in a mental institution mm -hmm. or they're gonna think you're a witch or something Ooh. don't do this again right so I kept it hidden for many many years so I go into a nursing home this had to be about two months ago so I'm up in Manchester so I go into this nursing home and I'm visiting this friend of mine. And as I'm walking out, I meet a Catholic independent priest. He said his name was Father this and that, and then he got speaking to me, it was, you know, we had a conversation. He literally followed me out to the parking lot and he said he was independent in the Catholic Church mm -hmm. as a priest, just very similar mm -hmm. to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then he explained to me that when people are dying and the family comes in, like two or three people mm -hmm. and they surround the bed, that he actually sees other people there. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah, we should talk. And this happened just about a month or two ago. Mm -hmm. So um, I wonder why some people have this sense, why people see this, and then other people, they don't see it at all. Do you know why? I think everybody's born with this gift. 
You do. And it's just as we get older and things start to fall away, the fairy tale beliefs, the belief in the Easter Bunny, right. Tooth Fairy, okay. and all that, we, we tend to lose our psychic ability. Okay. I, for some reason, just never lost it. I see. And okay. I just learned to develop it over the years, and that's why I, I ended up with Ed and Lorraine Warren, mm -hmm. because I was looking for some reason why I had this ability. W when I met them, it was like 1975, I was a magician. I was pulling rabbits out of the hat and cutting people in half, and it was just show business. But I met them in Newtown, they gave a presentation, and my reaction was, these guys are just showmen, they're, they're not real. I mean, that was my first impression. Mm -hmm. uh, then I saw the, the movie The Conjuring, and then I met the nephew, um, John Zaffis, is that right. his name? So mm -hmm. I met John, this had to be back in 2006, and he brought me into his museum and started showing me videos, and we, we spent like two hours together, and he explained to me that this phenomenon is real, uh, he showed me an exorcism, and I think you guys know of it, it was, yeah. where the eyes went back up yep. in the head, and then yeah, there was yeah. complete just whiteness in the eyes, no mm. pupil at all. Mm. And uh, after about two hours of talking with him, he says to me, he goes, would you like to be involved? And I'm like, let me think about it. And uh, one thing he said to me was, you cross the line, you can't go back. He said, you know, there's no way you can get involved with this work and then express this with your friends and family because you're going to be isolated. Do you, do you feel like you are isolated with well, this? I feel very odd. You Well, yeah, I, well, I feel odd too. Well, it's, it's, but it's a very odd ministry, to yeah. be honest with you. Do you bring this up at cocktail hours? I mean, <laughs> in networking groups? Well, you know I'm, what? I'm, I'm Father Larry and I do exercises. Well, if there's a lull in the conversation, <laughs> yes, I will, but... Um, no, not really. Did you see that movie that came out? I think it was called, was it called The Exorcist? It was about a priest, and I think it was Anthony Hopkins that played it. Oh, the right. Yeah. Uh, the right. The right. The right and right. he's having tr yeah. trouble with his faith, and mm -hmm. he doesn't know if he believes. And then they sent, I think they sent him to Rome, and then he meets somebody. It's been years. I remember yeah. seeing it on the plane. Uh, that That's based on the true story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, did you ever reach out to that priest? Have you ever talked to him, or do you know him? We don't know who he okay. is. No. All yeah. right. So, when I met John Zaffis, he tells me the story about a gentleman that lived very close to here. His name was Scott Peck. Familiar mm -hmm. book, right? Yes. Yes. He, he wrote a book, I think the first sentence was, Life is Difficult. The name of the book was The Road Less Traveled. Yes. And I read that book, it was a great book. He was a Buddhist, and then later on he becomes a non-denominational Christian. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second book he wrote, I think was, more on the road, less travel. But then later on, he wrote a book that caught my attention called The People of the Lie. I've read that. Yeah, and that's a scary book. Yes, it is. And he was, he was really saying that there are certain people, they do certain things, and it's not schizophrenia, it's not bipolar, it's not you know, manic mm -hmm. depressant, it's evil. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a book really about evil. Mm -hmm. So what I heard was, and I think I heard this through John, was Malachi Martin, who was a Jesuit priest, right? right. Reached mm -hmm. out to him and said, we, we need to have lunch, we need to get together. And then they worked on exorcisms together. Mm -hmm. And then he wrote a book called The Glimpses of the Devil, which was two cases of two exorcisms. And then shortly after, in New Preston, I think in Preston or New Preston, Connecticut, mm -hmm. he died, I think, of leukemia not too long after mm -hmm. all of this mm -hmm. happened. And uh, it kind of put the hair uh, standing up at the back of my neck when I heard these stories. So what are, what are some of the stories that you guys experienced? I know you sent me a video the other day, um, right. a case. You want to talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, we were uh, brought into this case last March okay. uh, in Maine. Mm -hmm. And um, this young man and his fiance and his sister played with a Ouija board. Mm. The fiance sat off to the side. She didn't want any part of it. She didn't believe in anything. Right. So the young man and his sister were playing back and forth. and. The planchette was moving and everything, and um, the young man said to the board, show my fiancé that you really exist. Immediately, she got pain throughout her whole body. She had to be put to bed. Mm -hmm. And so she figured, well, that's what the Ouija board was showing. Right. The next morning, she got up. She felt great. She got up. She made breakfast. She came back and uh, woke him up. He could not move. Could not move. He could not move. Okay. His head, he could only move his head back and forth like like he was having a seizure. They got him to the hospital. Um, his, they, they found nothing wrong with him. They did three days of testing. I mean, any testing they could 
they could find. They said it was a mental illness where he believed he was going through these symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, so she asked the cha uh, hospital chaplain to come in and pray over him. Mm -hmm. As the chaplain came in, he laid his Bible on the young man. Immediately, his arms and legs started moving. And they finally decided, okay, he was mentally ill, but we're gonna release him. We gave him some medicine and everything. He, they went home and his landlord said, where you guys been for a couple of days? He said, oh, he was in the hospital. They explained the whole thing to him. His uh, landlord said, well, you know what? Let's, my priest will, will see you. So he called up the priest. The priest says, yes, send them over at seven o'clock this evening. Mm -hmm. They went over, now this is in Portland, Maine. They went over and they walked in. The priest was not there, the bishop was there. And he said, this exorcism is just TV hype. Read these pamphlets, you'll be fine. So they didn't know what to do. So they contacted Central Maine Paranormal, mm -hmm. who, con who we knew, they contacted us and we went up to Maine to do an exorcism over the, the young man. Mm -hmm. We thought it was just going to be him, okay. and it wasn't. When we were exercising him, he got the uh, the young man got a look on his face like he wanted to kill Larry, and he didn't move. He didn't become violent. He just stared with pure hatred at Larry. As he, Larry's reading the ritual over and over again, I see another paranormal member out there with the fiance. She can't walk. Her legs swelled up, they're huge. They look like elephant legs. Mm -hmm. And I went out to help him and she couldn't talk. She, she was trying to say, Jesus, help me. And she'd go, J -j -j and she couldn't get it out. Right. So we managed to get her lying down. Larry came in and he prayed over her and she grabbed my hand and I thought she broke it. So much strength, I have never felt that. Finally, the demon released her, left, and none of the people in the house were baptized. So Larry spent the afternoon baptizing everybody. Mm -hmm. And as of today, a year later, they're fine. They're doing fine. They, the sister took the Ouija board back to Target. Wow. And she didn't you know, dispose of it or anything. Mm -hmm. She just took it back. Mm -hmm. You know, well, Greg, here's a situation where we have a bunch of paranormal investigators and psychics and all this other stuff doing the work of the priests and clergy that ought to be doing it. Well, you read my mind, um, because what I was going to say is uh, maybe three, four years ago, I was in Texas, and there was a big workshop, and there was a Lutheran minister uh, up at the pulpit, and he was just telling a story about an exorcism mm -hmm. that went wrong, or an exorcism that was actually not even attempted. But he went on to tell the story of this person coming to this church in Texas, and they were causing some trouble, and then he realized that this was a serious thing. It was a mental illness, that it was. And, you know, he went wow. on and talked about this for like 45 minutes, but he didn't tell the end of the story. So mm -hmm. after everyone left, I walked up to him and I said, so, uh, Reverend, um, how did that story end? Because it was a cliffhanger, you know? And he just looked at me and he goes, we couldn't do anything. And I thought to myself, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, like, you have to have special training or you have to have a gift or you have to, I guess it's a calling. Do you feel that both of you are called to do this or what? Well, I was always looking for why I had this gift. Okay. And when I met the Warrens, um, I was able to use it more and more on investigations. Okay. So I guess my gift is to help people. So, so were, were Lorraine and Ed Warren, in fact, I'm going to Monroe tomorrow and every time I drive through there, I always think of them. Uh, were they exorcists or were they ghost hunters? What they were they? ghost hunters. They were. Yeah. And what's the difference between a ghost hunter and an exorcist? Well, they were into the paranormal. Okay. Um, a, a blanket term. Okay. They were into ghosts, of course, okay. but they were into poltergeists and. Uh, right. They were into an awful and what, lot and what of exactly stuff. exactly is that compared to exorcism and compared to possession, I guess I would say? All right, say. poltergeists would be um, uh, things that are spontaneous combustion, uh, fires that happen. Okay. In, a, in a home, okay. water that it's coming happens. Coming out of coming the ceiling and no broken pipes. Yeah. No yeah. broken pipes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is this, 
is this for real or is this I know I know the movie The Conjuring was yeah. a movie and most of that wasn't real but it was yeah. based on mm. facts and right. the same yeah, thing it was based on facts and the same we, thing we've with been to the house you have yeah. and mm. the same thing with the movie The Exorcist yeah. I understand it wasn't a girl it was a little boy mm. right. I understand it was St. Louis mm -hmm. and I understand the Catholic priest was it true that the Catholic priest couldn't help them or maybe they did yeah, they did help but they it did. took a long they time did. I mean it was it, like, it takes a while sometimes like a month wasn't it I yeah. mean yeah. and they brought in other people so that mm -hmm. was based on a true story. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of people don't recognize that. So mm -hmm. what would you tell people who want to play around with invoking spirits or calling down deities or, or playing with Ouija boards? What would your advice be? Well, the person that's playing with a Ouija board is just a tool to contact spirits. It if is for real. If, if a spirit wants to contact you, you really don't need a Ouija board. You don't. They, you, they will just appear to you or talk to you or something like that. Has that ever happened to you, Father Larry? No, nope. okay. I, I am not psychic. Well, okay. everybody's psychic. Okay. No, All right. I'll, I'll say that much. But um, okay. I, um, <laughs> if I was really psychic, I would be able to do that which I do now. Okay. Because I'd be right. watching the, the, the floor, floor show. <laughs> we, we call it the floor show. What does that mean, the floor show? Well, the spirits coming in, the uh, the demons walking around, and they do walk around during an exorcism. They do? Yes. Okay, so in the liturgy, and I'm sure it's very similar to the Catholic liturgy, the priest or the minister will say during communion with angels, with archangels, and with mm -hmm. all the company of heaven, you know, this idea of in, in the sacrificial mass mm -hmm. or the mass or the service of the Lord's mm -hmm. Supper, there's this idea that there's other people here present. Mm -hmm. How many real Catholics, real Protestants, do you think Christians believe that? Well, whether they believe it or not, it really happens. You do believe oh, it? Oh, absolutely. You do? Absolutely. I've seen them. You have? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Tell us about that, Debbie. Okay, during, well, I remember one exorcism that he was doing. We were up in Simsbury doing this, this exorcism, and you could, even he felt the room get colder and colder, and I looked up, past the person we were exercising and there was this demon coming in and you could hear he had cloven hooves and you could hear his uh, footprint uh, footbeats on the wooden floor he he was really grotesque he had corns coming out of different parts of his head he had like pustules all over his body and he he, he stunk to high heavens he couldn't see him but the woman that was being exercised, she could see him. And you saw him? I saw him, yeah. And of course, these, this is only symbolic. They're, what they're, what do you mean by that, that it's symbolic? They're spirits. They just show themselves to you to show... Their power, their... Show, just to show off. And to scare you, yeah, I would right. think. And yeah. he, he was showing off. I mean, he would take one of the pustules and say this is his... Uh, Holy Eucharist from his true Lord. No you know. way. Yeah. That's blasphemy. That's well, he's a demon, so. And why did the demons fall? Because of pride. They like to show off, and you know, and they thought they were the number one in God's eyes. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. So let's talk about pride. Did you see that movie with, um, who was he? Uh, the Devil's Advocate. That's. Is you? that? Um, I can't think of his Al name. Al Pacino. Right. I wish yeah, I had an earpiece, and yeah. they were telling me. Yeah, I'm sorry. I haven't seen that. I missed that one. Yeah. So it's Al Pacino. He's like the head honcho of this law firm in mm -hmm. New York City, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a scene in it where he's on a subway and some guy's acting up and he starts speaking in a different language, a different tongue, you know, like Latin or mm -hmm. something or Spanish. And, but at the end of the movie, he talks about the fact that pride, he goes, oh, pride, it's, it's my favorite sin. And so there's a connection with that, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. uh, lust, money, Pride, envy, you know, I guess you know better than me what the seven deadly sins, but pride is the worst, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the downfall of marriages, the downfall of nations, the downfall of organizations, you know. Um, it always shows itself. I'm sorry? It always shows itself. And how does it? How does it show itself? Well, in, in, in the possession case, the demon always wants to show himself as who he is and what he is, and um, as much as they try to hide, they just can't do it. They have to tell their names and... How, you know. Im how important is it for you to get them to say their names? Does that give you power over them? Is that true? For some reason, yes, it, because you know who they are and what they do. The okay. name is um, not so much the name of, that they're called, but it, the name is um, 
their function. Okay, like legion. Yeah, okay. exactly. So in the Bible, you see Jesus casting out demons. Yeah. You see the apostles going out and casting out right. demons. Yeah. You think it's possible today. How come the church doesn't talk about it as much? They I think they should. I mean, we all have the ability to cast out demons in Jesus' name. It's he there. gave it to us. It's there in, I think, in the right. book of Acts, maybe, right? You yeah. Know? Okay, or the and Gospels. It, and he didn't say, stop off and ask your bishop if it's okay to do this. Right. You know, he said, in my name, go out and cast out demons. Were, weren't you scared the first time you did this? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so tell us about that experience. Well, I, I worked on a, on a case that was on uh, was on sol Unsolved Mysteries. Right. Well, to, to make a long story How short. How long ago was this? A long story short, which I can't do. Okay. It was a very it was, it was a very bad possession case. All Where right? was this? This this was uh, it was a woman from St. Louis, and Missouri, she came to Simsbury. and she came to Simsbury, Connecticut. Wow! And I, and I worked on her. And I um, think I may have heard of this story. She so. had many demons. Was yeah. the whole house? Oh yeah, I know yeah. this story. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I heard this story right. through a friend. And of mine. she, at one point, I was outside with her, with a police officer that was part of our group, and. Um, she started to levitate towards the Farmington River. What, what do you mean levitate towards come the up farm? With, come off, her feet started to come up off the ground. Parlor we were, trick? No, we no were right by trick. the, no, we were no right by the uh, Farmington River and she flung her head backwards and she screamed, Michael, no. Who was Michael? It was St. Michael. Why was he? Again, because I looked up, the cop looked up with me and out of the sun came this band of angels and I, this, I know this sounds ridiculous. You sound crazy. I you, know. You sound crazy. And in front of it was this angel on a horse and he had red hair and she just kept saying, Michael's coming, no. And she flung back and all of a sudden she sat back up, the vision ended, she sat back up and she goes, one left. Did you see the vision or did she see the I vision? I saw the vision you and so did the police officer. You got to be kidding me. No. The police officer saw this? Yes. Okay, that really gets my attention because this is an outside source. It's not like he has a vested interest. Right, no. I'd like to see that police report. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was working as a paranormal investigator oh, at that was. time. So. Okay, okay. Wow. So do you have, not that I want to learn the right, uh, but is the right in Latin or is that just show business? Uh, they say that the best thing to do is to do it in Latin. Really? But. Okay. But. All right. I have always done it in English. Okay. Right. So it works in English. <laughs> <laughs> so, they, they so the demons know English just as bad. They say the demons are afraid of Latin. They are they're, afraid they're of Latin. Well, they're afraid of English. <laughs> there was something interesting. He was doing the right in English. Yeah. And one of the clients was saying it in Latin. And she didn't speak Latin. She came from West Virginia. Oh, my you, this is almost like tongues, like, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, if you read the book of Acts, you start seeing things. You see Jesus Christ in the Gospels doing certain things. And then in the book of Acts, you see the apostles mm -hmm. acting out the same way Jesus did. Mm -hmm. They start, you know, doing mm -hmm. these things. Yeah. And they start having visions. And people come up and they mm -hmm. touch their garments and they're mm -hmm. healed. You know, there's, there's a connection between mm -hmm. the two. Not that I'm a theologian, but I know a little bit about it, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell us one of the most scariest situations that both of you guys have been in either as a group or independently you know things that have happened oh, what would you say well let me tell you go ahead what would you say witchy poo nah. no no well, what's the story behind that what's witchy poo? uh we were brought in by a woman uh to help her daughter her daughter woke up that morning and on her shoulder her daughter was in her 30s on her shoulder was scratched not yours what and did she do it or did no, someone else they, do they, it? Well, it was back where she couldn't have reached, okay, you know. Gotcha. And her, that night they had had fires erupting throughout their house. On one door, there was a cross burnt and that was the door to the attic. Um, for some reason, we were able to go right there and they met us out. They were sitting out in the lawn. They were afraid to go in the house. They mm -hmm. met us and she was an elderly woman or so she looked, and she was dressed perfectly. I mean, her skirt and her high button boots that she was wearing at the time, and hat and everything matched. She had turquoise all over, she had a turquoise cane, and uh, she hobbled to meet us, and her daughter was just in jeans and, you know, just normally. 
They took us in the house. We took a tour of the house. The house was in disarray. And the, they would tell us that garbage from the kitchen would end up in the kids' bedroom. And it, this was a Victorian house with no center hallway. So all the rooms just came off all the other rooms. And there was heavy feeling in all the rooms. We, we toured down into to the rooms. We went downstairs. We sat in the living room. And it's an old-fashioned living room where there's the living room, and then there's the dining room, and then the kitchen. And um, the daughter was petrified to have an exorcism. Why? I, I guess she had seen the, the movie. Sure. I mean, it's not, you know, it's Hollywood High. Sure, yeah. And the mother says, oh, let me sit there first, and I'll show her it's nothing. So Larry starts the prayers over the mother, and the mother's sitting there very calmly, and all of a sudden, she starts pulling at all her turquoise, and she's pulling it off, and she's ripping off all these things and throwing them all over the living room. Sounds like a mental problem. She grabs him. She does. Yeah, grabs his stole and start the elderly, frail old right. lady grabs yeah. her stole and starts yanking him to the floor. Wow. John Zaffis was with us at yep. that time. We all sprang into action mm -hmm. to to get her to stop and we were you know we were literally afraid to touch her because she looked that frail okay but we managed to get her down and she locked eyes with me and she picked you up no she locked eyes with me and she goes your lungs are having problems aren't you oh my now i'm an asthmatic wow and she goes you can't breathe and i go into an asthma attack really? and john said don't look at her and i can't break the the the, the gaze, gaze the gaze so he throws holy water in her face which makes me break the case okay so he continues praying a few minutes later she goes oh I'm so sorry she gets to be the frail lady again she goes I don't know what came over me she goes let me go outside please pray over my daughter so we get her daughter into okay. the seat right and he's praying over her, and we hear her high button boots come in the back door and they're coming in and she comes in the only exit we have in the house and she's got a claw hammer and a metal ball you got to be kidding no. me. Wow. She goes, who the F invited you here? Really? Wow. And go ahead. You that's can tell amazing. the rest of it. <laughs> wow. That's, that's scary. That was scary. So how did it end? I mean. Well, we fled the house. <laughs> you fled. You yeah. ran. Yeah, she left. We, we, calm, she we, we calmed her down. Okay. We calmed her, they calmed her down. She had put out her hand like this towards her daughter. Right. I don't know why I stepped in front of her and her daughter right. and I actually felt hot air coming off of whatever she was doing and so she went upstairs she got mad and went upstairs we fled the house we mm -hmm. fled off the property John said get off the property don't be on this property mm -hmm. as we're fl going across the lawn she's coming out the back door she's all dressed in purple with a black cape and John looks at the daughter and said where did she get that and the daughter says, oh, she was in a coven. She was the high priestess a while back. You Nobody had told us did anything. did not know that. There's Talk a lot of things we don't know when we go on these <laughs> So have you ever thought of like taking all of these stories and like putting them in a book? Yeah, we have a book that okay. is in the works. Uh, okay. Just got to add the pictures and get it to a publisher. So how do folks get a hold of you if they're here in... You know, knocks in, in the night or, you know, something weird's going on. I mean, some of it's natural, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go into a house or yeah. go into a right. situation mm -hmm. and find out that somebody needs medication. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, you know, there's a tree that's banging up against mm -hmm. the wall, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's right. nothing. Mm -hmm. Or they need to call the plumber. But maybe they need to reach out and call you or find you. How, mm -hmm. do, they, how do they get a hold of you guys? Well, we have Facebook pages. Okay, so mm -hmm. give that information uh, Okay, uh, they can contact me at uh, Debbie... Chamberlain Elward okay. on Facebook, and I will respond to him. Okay. And Larry has his own Facebook page. And your your father, Larry, right? Is it Father Larry? Well, on he's Facebook? got Larry Elward. I'm oh, you're father. Larry. Okay. I'm not father on Facebook. No, you're not father on Facebook. All right. I'm grandfather. Yeah. Grandfather. That's grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, I, I got to ask you. You know, we only have a minute left, so and it's almost like a cliffhanger here. Mm -hmm. And I want to hear more stories. A couple other things I want to ask you. Right. Would it be okay if you guys were to come back and we did another episode? Because like we sure. did 29 minutes already. 
Right. I mean, it's, that went it's, fast. It's, 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 yeah. it, well, we're in the moment. The name of the show is called Mindful Conversations. Mm -hmm. We didn't script this. We didn't work mm -hmm. it. So right. anyway, we will catch you guys next time on Mindful Conversations. Mm -hmm. We hope we gave you something to think about. We're Debbie and Father Larry. We will catch you next time. Mind yourself. <laughs>